The recognized symbol of excellence in online entertainment. And good evening. Welcome to tonight's broadcast of the BRS Heroes program. And I'm your host, George Pardos. <clears throat> so I want to talk tonight about something that uh, um, that is kind of, uh, you know, kind of important to me and, and among other to other people. So today was the day that uh, I went and stepped on the yellow footprints at Paris Island. And it, it you know, this is why tonight's episode is uh, we're going to talk about coaches, drones. Um, drill instructors and you know the like so one of the things that um, I found very interesting is that uh, um, that there, there's different kind of coach you know just like in boot camp there was different kind of drill instructors you had your 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 senior drill instructor was like supposed to be the calm one. And then you had the, you know, we had three, we, now we had, when I went, I uh, went July of 84, I mean, June, July, August of 1984, um, we had three drill instructors. Now there are some other um, um, <clears throat> uh, platoons that had four, but our heavy was uh, Sergeant Parker and he hated everybody. I mean, he hated, he hated everybody, but the, the, and then Sergeant Herring was like your older brother who was, uh, uh, you know, who was, you know, the guy that was supposed to help you. And then Sergeant Hamrick was our senior who was really, you know, he was like, you're more like your dad. Now, he did yell at us, but not as much. And one of the things that I want to talk about is over the years we had, I've had the luxury of being around some, you know, my freshman year at Ohio state, we had three Olympians. Um, that was, there were my coach, my first two years at Ohio state, uh, Doug Lubaum, uh, Russ Ellickson and Mark Coleman. And they were our coaches and each of them had a very different style of, of coaching. Now, you, you know, you would think that, you know, that to be successful, that everybody has the same, you know, the same kind of coaching pattern and they're not. So Russ was more of an authoritarian and Mark was far from being an authoritarian and Doug uh, blue ball was just uh, get on the mat. And Mark and Doug were more like each other than, than Russ was, but Mark was kind of like, um, you know, he did not, uh, he was not the guy you, that consoled you. He was not the guy that, that coddled you. And he was basically get on the mat. All right. That's great. You had a bad day at school, get on the mat. And the, the reason for that was that, that, that this was his style. And I got to tell you something, good athletes don't always make good coaching and good co great coaches don't, you know, not necessarily have been great athletes in their tenure. One of the worst experiences I've ever had with a coach, and he he's a great guy, and one-on-one, -on -one, he's a great person to work out with. As a coach trying to, to teach you how to do stuff, he is not very good, and that's Mark Schultz. And, you know, Mark was – now his brother, Dave, was, you know, when I was at Fox Catcher for a while, his brother was a, a, a great guy, but Mark – could not convert the energy that he put into competing into also coaching for people. And, you know, we would be on the mat and he would be trying to teach you a move. And in front of a group, he was, he was not very good at that. Dave knew the move inside and out from, you know, from beginning to end. I mean, so if Dave showed you a move, it didn't matter. You know, he would go from the setup, to the, you know, the transition to the end, to, you know, to everything in it. And he was very good at that. And, and the thing about it that made Dave so good was that he had a great understanding, a fundamental understanding of not only the sport, but a pos positioning and transition. And one of the things that, that you wind up taking from that is that 
when you start having to learn a craft, if somebody is going to teach you something, they have to understand the, the basic fundamentals of the craft that they're trying to teach you. So Dave understood that, you know, in order to get a better position on the mat, you had to lower your levels. Now, if you didn't lower your level and you just went straight attack, you know, he would just, you know, he would say, you know, we're, you know, you're going to have to overpower somebody. And, you know, once you get to the elite level, everybody can do that. Everybody can shoot a single leg. Everybody can has an arm drag. Everybody has a, a duck under. You have to be able to execute this much more than the guy that you're, you're going up against because everybody can do the same thing. And it, it's like, I, I saw something the other day that it kind of intrigued me. It was uh, the guys from and one. And, you know, they were talking about um, there's this guy named hot sauce that is, they, you know, they, they play street basketball and they go around and they travel to these, all the places and they, and they play these games. And one of them, you know, a lot of people say, Oh yeah, they, I could have played. No, you couldn't play it in the NBA. And the guy, and one of the guys that came out and said, He's like, there's only been 5,000 NBA basketball players all time. That's it. Now, you know, that's not a lot of, uh, that's not a lot of play. There's not a lot of players to, to have played in the NBA all time. I mean, there's 30 teams. Uh, I, I think there's 30 teams. I don't know. I'm not a big basketball fan. I think there's 30 teams and each team has 12 men. So that's only 360. You know, given comparison, football has 32 teams, 52, te you know, guys, there's six, you know, 1600, you know, there's 1600 people in the NFL at one at given one time, you know, there's only 360 in the NBA. I mean, it, it's to play in the NBA, it's more lead. And the guys were sitting there saying about this was saying, well, wait a second, you're not that good. Everybody can do this at the elite level. Everybody's got handles. Everybody can dribble. Everybody has a jump shot. Everybody can, you know, can score. You have to be, you know, this much better than the, you know, the rest of them. And so one of the things that has happened recently, and especially in the last, I'm going to say in the last 20 years, is that we have designed specialty coaching for things that normally weren't coached before. And I, I'll, you know, I'll give you an example. The, the idea of measuring, um, you know, of getting quantitative numbers for athletes has just recently started in the last 20 years. Um, it, you know, Spark came out in the early 2000s with a program to, ba you know, to basically, um, you know, get everybody to, to get everybody on board to give them a rating, you know, uh, how fast you are, how strong you are, you know, your, your, your speed and everything else. And as a result of that, that has just recently started. That hasn't been around, you know, for a long time. The point that I'm, the, the, the reason I'm, I'm saying all of this is that um, metrics have just been introduced in the last, you know, um, probably in the last 20 years. And as a result of that, we, we've introduced specialty coaching. You're, you know, LeBron got a shooting coach. Stephen Curry's got a shooting coach. Um, you know, they, they bring in coaches just to, to you know, teach you how to shoot. Um, you know, where before, you know, they weren't, you know, they not only now are they analyzing you, for how long it's taken you to, to, to catch the ball, to release, you know, what arc the you're, you're releasing, what, you know, the arc of your shot um, they're, they're measuring on all that. And now where, where it only used to be, you know, a, a little bit of coaching or, a, you know, now they are uh, coaching you on things that, you know, 20, 30, you know, 20 years ago, people weren't coaching on this. And is it for the better? Yeah, maybe. I mean, you know, it, it's, uh, you know, could, you know, could you have played today? You know, could, could players from yesterday have played today? Sure. And vice versa. Um, the difference is could a Bill Lambeer, you know, play today 
um, you know, taken away the, you know, the bad boy things of the the seventies. And the, I mean, you know, I think he was from in the eighties. Could he have played today? Maybe. I don't, I don't know. I don't know if he would have been able to, to transfer, but the point is that now, um, you know, Kevin Garnett has, you know, got a shooting coach. Everybody's they've got coaches to teach you how to play the game at every angle. They never had that, that before. And if you take a look at the, at the style of play that is being played today in the NFL or even in basketball, it, it is completely, it does not look like it did back in the, in the eighties or even in the nineties. And the reason is, well, and, and the most reason is money, money has changed everything. And I will tell you this, <clears throat> and I and I pointed this out before. Not only has money changed everything, but equipment has changed everything. When um, one of my favorite players to, to to watch of all time, and I, he I think he only played in forty or forty two uh, games ever was Gail Sayers. Now Gail Sayers numbers were just incredible. I mean. Him and, and Jim Brown's numbers were just um, incredible. But Gail Sayers had a knee injury that ended his career, and he was never able to come back. Had he had that injury post-2000, he would have been a – had, you know, his injury happen, uh, you know, past the – after 2000, he would have been play, able to play another 100 games. Um, back then, they didn't have the, the you know, the surgical techniques. Even uh, uh, Derek Rose and the surgery he had wasn't available till after 2006. So when they, you know, they compare in eras, it, it's not fair. Um, you know, the and, and so, you know, I always look at, you know, always talk about this, about coaching. You know, the coaches back then had to be, you you had to get more out of your players that, um, you know, they, it, I'm not going to say it was more athleticism, but they didn't have a lot of the things that they have today. Um, I'm, <clears throat> I'm going to give a prime example and only because many me is listening to this. Um, and I can't remember if it's, um, Bart Starr was, um, you know, when he played for the uh, the Green Bay Packers, uh, Vince Lombardi was his coach. And he won three championships in four years. Two Super Bowls, and I think in between they had won, and they had won another NFL championship before they had bind them. But Max McGee, uh, who was the wideout for him, you know, in one of the Super Bowls, had a part-time job as a car salesman Um even though he was playing for the Green Bay Packers. And the reason was they didn't have the, the, the Green Bay. No one in the NFL had the money that, you know, to pay a lot of people to play full time. There were guys that um, they would work at the mill or they would work at some and then go to practice at four o'clock. And they would, you know, they would go to practice after they got done. Uh, having, you know, whatever, you know, their shift. As a result of that, the game was different. Um, I, and I don't remember what the, the first, you know, I know Joe Namath was the first NFL player to make over 100,000, but it wasn't until the 1990s that, you know, that the NFL changed with the, you know, with them selling the rights to Fox uh, for them to have, you know, to, to have football. And I had posted a picture. I don't want to see if I can do this. Um, and I had posted a picture before of the Detroit Lions, 1961. And or um, I'll pull this up again because um, um, this is uh, their team, you know, the team picture um, in 1961. Um you know, this is uh, da, 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 da. Uh, hold on a second. Yeah, let me see if I can. Uh, um, let me see if I can pull this up. 
uh, slides. Yeah, I'm not going to be able to do that. Um, but there's a picture of the the, the team, um, and um, and the team is it's a very small, uh, you know, it's not a very big team, right? And 30 years later, it, you know, you've got coaches, you've got, you know, you've got a whole bunch of different people on there, and, and it just and and why? Well, because you have the advent of, you know, the TV broadcasting, you know, players are making million dollar contracts and, you know, it's, it's, it, 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 the game has changed and now everybody. So what does it have to do about coaching? Well, here's, here's the thing. Coaching dictates the level of play. Money dictates the level of coaching. So, you know, when, and, and I'll give you a prime example. When I was at Ohio state, I started at, at at Ohio State in in the fall of 1988, and I, I'll use the Marine Corps, and I will use the um, I wrestled for the Marine Corps the year prior. We had three coaches, three, and we had Gunny Williams as our head coach. Um, Greg Gibson was the the lead assistant, but he was also competing, and I can't remember. Uh, I think it was Lou Dorrance was our or you know he was also but he was a, he was an assistant so i mean we only had three coaches and we had like 30 some guys on the team but gunny was the head coach and you know but and we had two assistant coaches that and now today um the marine corps has kind of gotten rid of their you know their, their team but i'm going to use the army team because i also wrestled for the army the army team now has five coaches and, you know, and so when the, when you start looking at that, um, uh, you know, when you, um, when you take a look at the, at the coaches, then um, they are, you know, they have, uh, you know, a bunch of, um, uh, I, you know, they have a, a, a bigger team. Why is that? And, um, well, it's because that, uh, you know, they've got, you know, they've got money, basically it's money. So a lot of the things that they have is when you bring on a coach for money, um, they're going to get you better results. And, you know, that's where, you know, that's where the, um, you know, that's where the, you know, the, the big, um, you know, the big, um, you know, the, the big differences are. And so, you know, when Tiger Woods, you know, Tiger Woods has a coach, you know, his coach, you know, he has a hitting coach, he has a driving coach, he has, you know, and everybody needs that kind of coaching. And what I think is lost in, um, in today about, you know, when you're competing and, you know, you're, you're, uh, um, when you're competing and there is that the game looks a lot different because there's a lot of, <clears throat> there's a lot more money in it. And the, the amount of money that they're putting into the game is because of television rights. And, you know, there's, um, and I don't know what the NFL ticket, um, um, I don't know what the NFL ticket costs right now, but, uh, you know, it is, it, it, it's, it's expensive. I mean, you know, the NFL ticket, I think is, uh, let's look that up. Um, uh, direct TV, NFL ticket, direct TV is Sunday ticket. Wow. Um, yeah, it's kind of expensive. Um, Um, so the premiere is $139. So, um, I mean, that's, you know, that's kind of expensive. So going back to that, um, I, when, 
when you go and, and you take a look at the at what's going to on today, that's why sports look so much different. I mean, it, it's just that uh, sports look so much different today than they did 30 years ago or 40 years ago is because you have better coaching. You have more money being thrown at it. Um, the athletes are getting paid to be there full time. And, you know, what the offset is that, uh, you know, that they're, the amount of uh, money that is being thrown at them is um, that, you know, the amount of the money that is being thrown at, at uh, coaching and players. And, you know, now even college players are getting a million a year uh, with the NIL, the name and image likeness, they're getting a million dollars a year. You're, you're having a lot more, um, you know, that you're having a lot more money, money gets you results. Um, and I think that that's one of the things that it's going, you know, it's going to be a little bit, you know, it's going to be different down the road. And I think that's the other thing that uh, um, is going to be, it, it's, it's going to be different is that you're going to get better results because you do have, you know, better coaching, better money, you know, and if somebody paid you, you know, $40 million a year to throw a ball. Yeah. You're going to put a best product on the field ever. And that's all I got for tonight. Um, I am going to talk a little bit about, I want to close the show up with, with a couple things that uh, uh, have been going on. And I got to tell you, I become a big fan of this guy. Uh, well, I was always a fan, but I become a bigger fan than this guy uh, recently. Um, so I met a, uh, I met a U.S. Navy SEAL by the name of Scott Daly, um, and hopefully he's, uh, you know, we're going to get him to to do some work, um, you know, come on the show. Um, but Scott Daly said something to me and was absolutely the funniest thing ever. The, the first, the, the top two jobs in the United States that people lie about um, that have been is firemen and Navy SEALs. Now, I don't know why that is, but people lie about that. So there's a guy by the name of Don Shipley who is a U.S. He was a, he's a retired U.S. Navy SEAL. Um, he, he was um, an instructor for demolition um, with with the SEALs, and he runs um, the this uh, website. I mean, and not just a website, but he does a YouTube channel on fake Navy SEALs. And about you know he calls them out, and some of the guys that have been on there are just absolutely hilarious. Um, like the guy that says he was an MOS 738. He, you know, uh, jumped into Bosnia and got a purple heart. I mean, some of these guys that are outlandish and, and what's funny about it is that um, the guys that are lying about it do not understand the lie. And, and, and what's funny and what, and what I mean by that? Well, they don't understand the, you know, how to, how to lie and how to tell the, the, you know, the truth. And what I mean by that is that, um, you know, like they get, um, they come up with these stories that that's a, Oh, my, um, my records are classified. Um, you know, I, I, you know, I was with this, I, you know, I went to the CIA, I came out and for those that, you know, that follow the, the SEAL training, um, the, the cl your class is called BUDS, Basic Underwater Demolition. It's about 26 long, weeks long. And, you know, you, in order to, now, if you graduate BUDS, that does not mean you're a Navy SEAL. You have to go on to the, to the team, to a, a SEAL team to get your Trident before, you know. But you can graduate BUDS and not be a Navy SEAL. You cannot be a Navy SEAL without graduating BUDS, with the exception of Vietnam-era corpsmen. And one of the guys that graduated um, that that was a, a, a SEAL corpsman was a guy by the name of Max Jordan. Max Jordan was during Vietnam, and he... I mean, this guy, I, I, I give him, I salute you, sir. You're a badass. Um, but these guys come up with these outlandish stories. And I'm like, you know, Zeus on a pita, what the hell are you thinking? 
like, seriously, why would you, you know, lie about that knowing that stolen valor is a, you know, um, it, you know, that, that stolen valor is such a big deal. And, but they did yet they are there. Um, they are just incredible. Um, how bad did, you know, they lie about things. And on top of it is somebody's going to catch you. And eventually, you know, they are going to, you know, to, to call you out and be, because especially if, if you lie about your service or, you know, if you, and, and it's one thing, everybody, you know, is, uh, Hey, Michelle, how you doing? Um, if you lie about your service and you get monetary gain, it is going to piss off the wrong account of people. So there's, in a veteran community, one of the things that has happened, and, and it is, is that the the VA is really not helping as much as they should. Why is that? Well, because they're taxed. Any government system is going to do that. So a lot of private organizations, and there are wonderful private organizations that move forward to help veterans. Um, you know, 22 toll none um, is one we deal with. And the the people over there are just the salt of the earth. Green Beret Foundation, um, you know, they, they have gone out of their way to help veterans, whether it's for housing, whether it's for transportation, whether it is for, um, you know, you need help with your, your utility bills, you need help with you know, those kind of things. They have go out of their way to raise money to help them. Project Steel does the same thing. There's a lot of those people out there that have, have, have helped out there. If you lie about your service and you're taking funds and resources away from other veterans, you're going to piss other veterans off. And, and let me say that. If you start taking money that should go to a, a, a deserving veteran and then you do it for your own personal gain and you're not a veteran or you lied about your service or that, you're going to piss off a class of people that are going to come after you. One of the guys that we that we have helped came out and that one of the things that happened was he came out and said that, you know, he had gotten a Purple Heart. Well, he took he got money for that and that could have actually gone to a real purple heart recipient that would have needed the money more than he did. And I, I caution you as a veteran, I did not, I'm going to say this and I've, I, and I've said this to before, I have done nothing special during my career, nothing. I have, you know, you know, during the, the time I was in Marine Corps, I was just a, you know, dumb fucking grunt. But I've never ever taken money or I've never taken food off another vet's table for my own gain, ever. And I caution you with people that are doing that for their own gain um, because they are hurting the process because then what it does is it turns – other veterans away from helping and it, and it, and it, and it poisons the well. So if you, if you do know somebody that is, um, um, that is a, you know, that is doing that, turn them in. That's all I have to say about that. Anyway, thank you for joining VRS. Um, we have six more days before we have, uh, we're to the bottom of the, the band, um, so, um, 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 so we have, um, six more days to our ban is lifted or we're off restriction. Uh, and we are working on, uh, you know, going on other platforms, but it is, it is what it is. We're dealing with some, you know, Facebook and social media are not the friendliest places, but again, I, I always say this, if you think somebody's out there stealing, you know, with stolen valor turn them in, there's plenty of um, number one, and the best guy ever is Snake over at Stolen Valor, the, the Stolen Valor group. That guy is relentless. Uh, Scotty Hughes, 
um, you know, uh, Doug Sterner. Those are guys that reach out to them or reach out to us. We'll put you in contact with them because don't take, you know, like I said, don't take food off of other veterans tables for your own self gain. If, if you haven't earned it anyway, that's all I got for tonight. Um, you guys take care of yourself and we'll see you here uh, tomorrow. The recognized symbol of excellence in online entertainment.